Section 4 of The Living Animals of the World, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Fraser Prescott, Grand Rapids, Michigan. The Living Animals of the World, Volume 1. Mammals by Charles Lewis Cornish, Editor. The Gerezes and the Gwenons, the Macaques, the Baboons. Among the ordinary monkeys of the Old World are some with very striking hair and colors. The Gereza of Abyssinia has bright white and black fur with long white fringes on the sides. This is the black and white skin fastened by the Abyssinians to their shields and, if we're not wrong, by the Kaffirs also. Among the Gwenons, a large tribe of monkeys living in the African forest, many of which find their way here as organ monkeys, is the Diana, a most beautiful creature living on the Guinea coast. It has a white crescent on its forehead, bluish gray fur, a white beard, and a patch of brilliant chestnut on the back, the belly white and orange. A lady, Mrs. Bowditch, gives the following account of a Diana monkey on board ship. It jumped onto her shoulder, stared into her face, and then made friends, seated itself on her knees, and carefully examined her hands. He then tried to pull off my rings. When I gave him some biscuits, and making a bed for him with my handkerchief, he then settled himself comfortably to sleep, and from that moment we were sworn allies. When mischievous, he was often banished to a hen coop. Much more effect was produced by taking him in sight of the panther, who always seemed most willing to devour him. On these occasions, I held him by the tail before the cage, but long before I reached it, knowing where he was going, he pretended to be dead. His eyes were closed quite fast, and every limb was as stiff as though there were no life in him. When taken away, he would open one eye a little to see whereabouts he might be. But if he caught sight of the panther's cage, it was instantly closed, and he became as stiff as before. This monkey stole the men's knives, tools, and handkerchiefs, and even their caps, which he threw into the sea. He would carefully feed the parrots, chewing up biscuit and presenting them with the bits. And he caught another small monkey and painted it black. Altogether, he must have enlivened the voyage. The Grivet monkey, the Green monkey, the Mona monkey, and the Mangabe are other commonly seen African species. The macaques, of which there are many kinds, from the Rock of Gibraltar to Far Japan, occupy the catalog between the Gwenon and the Baboon. The common macaque and many others have tails. Those of Japan and some of those of China, notably the Chelly monkey, kept outside the monkey house at the zoo, and the Japanese macaque at the other entrance, are tailless and much more like anthropoid apes. The Chelly monkey is large and powerful but other macaques are of all sizes, down to little creatures no bigger than a kitten. Some live in the hottest plains, others in the mountains. The common macaque, found in the Malay archipelago, is a strong, medium-sized monkey. The Formosan macaque is a rock-living creature. Those of Japan inhabit the pine groves and are fond of pelting anyone who passes with stones and fir cones. The bonnet macaque is an amusing little beast, very fond of hugging and nursing others in captivity. The bandar, or rhesus monkey, a common species, also belongs to this group. But the most interesting to Europeans is the mago, or Barbary ape. It is the last monkey left in Europe. There it only lives on the rock of Gibraltar. It was the monkey which Galen is said to have dissected because he was not permitted to dissect a human body. These monkeys are carefully preserved upon the rock. Formerly, when they were more common, they were very mischievous.
The following story was told by Mr. Bidcup. The apes of the rock, led by one particular monkey, were always stealing from the kit of a certain regiment encamped there. At last, the soldiers caught the leader, shaved his head and face, and turned him loose. His friends, who had been watching, received him with a shower of sticks and stones. In these desperate circumstances, the ape sneaked back to his old enemies, the soldiers, with whom he remained. Lord Heathfield, a former governor of the Rock, would never let them be hurt, and on one occasion, when the Spaniards were attempting a surprise, the noise made by the apes gave notice of their attempt. The Baboons Far the most interesting of the apes in the wild state are the baboons. Their dog-like heads, which in some are so large and hideous that they look like a cross between an ill-tempered dog and a pig, short bodies, enormously strong arms, and loud barking cry distinguish them from all other creatures. The greater number, for there are many kinds, live in the hot, dry, stony parts of Africa. They are familiar figures from the cliffs of Abyssinia to the Cape, where their bold and predatory bands still occupy Table Mountain. They are almost the only animals which the high contracting powers of Africa have resolved not to protect at any season. So mischievous are they to crops, and recently to the flocks. They kill the suckling lambs and tear them to pieces for the sake of the milk contained in their bodies. One of the best known baboons is the Chakma of South Africa. The old males grow to a great size and are most formidable creatures. Naturally, they are very seldom caught, but one very large one is in the Zoological Gardens, Regent's Park, at the time of writing. The keeper declares he would rather go into a lion's cage than into the den of this beast when angry. Its head is nearly one-third of its total length from nose to the root of the tail. Its jaw power is immense, and its forearm looks as strong as Sandow's. Like all monkeys, this creature has the power of springing instantaneously from a sitting position, and its bite would cripple anything from a man to a leopard. The Chakmas live in companies in the Kopjas, whence they descend to forge the mealy grounds, riverbeds, and bush. Thence they come down to steal fruit and pumpkins or corn, turn over the stones and catch beetles, or eat locusts. Their robbing expeditions are organized. Scouts keep a lookout, the females and young are put in the center, and the retreat is protected by the old males. Children in the Cape Colony are always warned not to go out when the baboons are near. When irritated, and they are very touchy in their tempers, the whole of the males will sometimes charge and attack. The possibility of this is very unpleasant and renders people cautious. Not many years ago, a well-known sportsman was shooting in Somaliland. On the other side of a rocky ravine was a troop of baboons of a species of which no examples were in the British Museum. Though he knew the danger, he was tempted to shoot and to secure a skin. At 200 yards, he killed one dead, which the rest did not notice. Then he hit another and wounded it. The baboon screamed, and instantly the others sat up, saw the malefactor, and charged straight for him. Most fortunately, they had to scramble down the ravine and up again, by which time the sportsman and his servant had put such a distance between them, making very good time over the flat, that the baboons contented themselves by barking defiance at them when they reached the level ground. They are the only mammals which thoroughly understand combination for defense as well as attack. But Brain, the German traveler, gives a charming story of genuine courage and self-sacrifice shown by one. His hunting dogs gave chase to a troop which was retreating to some cliffs and cut off a very young one, which ran up onto a rock only just out of the reach of the dogs. An old male baboon saw this, and came alone to the rescue. Slowly and deliberately he descended, crossed the open space, 
and stamping his hands on the ground, showing his teeth, and backed by the furious barks of the rest of the baboons, he disconcerted and cowed these savage dogs, climbed onto the rock, picked up the baby, and carried him back safely. If the dogs had attacked the old patriarch, his tribe would probably have helped him. Burchell, the naturalist after whom Burchell's zebra is named, let his dogs chase a troop. The baboons turned on them, killed one on the spot by butting through the great blood vessels of the neck, and laid bare the ribs of another. The Cape Dutch in the old colony would rather let their dogs bait a lion than a troop of baboons. The rescue of the infant Chakma, which Bram saw himself, is a remarkable and indeed the most incontestable instance of the exhibition of courage and self-sacrifice by a male animal. If the baboons were not generally liable to become bad-tempered when they grow old, they could probably be trained to be among the most useful of animal helpers and servers. But they are so formidable and so uncertain in temper that they are almost too dangerous for attempts at semi-domestication. When experiments have been made, they have had remarkable results. Le Vaillant, one of the early explorers in South Africa, had a chakma baboon which was a better watch than any of his dogs. It gave warning of any creature approaching the camp at night, long before the dogs could hear or smell it. He took it out with him when he was shooting and used to let it collect edible roots for him. The latest example of a trained baboon only died a few years ago. It belonged to a railway signalman at Utenhag Station, about 200 miles up country from Port Elizabeth in Cape Colony. The man had the misfortune to undergo an operation in which both his feet were amputated after being crushed by the wheels of a train. Being an ingenious fellow, he taught his baboon, which was a full-grown one, to pull him along the line on a trolley to the distant signal. There, the baboon stopped at the word of command and the man would work the lever himself. But in time, he taught the baboon to do it while he sat on the trolley, ready to help if any mistake were made. The Chakmas have for relations a number of other baboons in the rocky parts of the African continent, most of which almost the same habits and are not very different in appearance. Among them is the Gelida baboon, a species very common in the rocky highlands of Abyssinia. Another is the Anubis baboon of the west coast of Africa. The latter is numerous around the Portuguese settlement of Angola. Whether the so-called common baboon of the menageries is a separate species or only the young of some one of the above mentioned is not very clear. But about another variety there can be no doubt. It has been separated from the rest since the days of the pharaohs. It does not differ in habits from the other baboons, but inhabits the rocky parts of the Nile Valley. It appears in Egyptian mythology under the name of Thoth and is constantly seen in the sculptures and hieroglyphs. Equally strong and far more repulsive are the two baboons of West Africa, the drill and the mandrill. As young specimens of these beasts are the only ones at all easily caught, and these nearly always die when cutting their second teeth when in captivity, large adult mandrills are seldom seen in Europe. They grow to a great size and are probably the most hideous of all beasts. The frightful nose, high cheekbones, and pig-like eyes are the basis of the horrible heads of devils and goblins which Albert Dürer and other German or Dutch medieval painters sometimes put on canvas. Add to the figure the misplaced bright colors, cobalt blue on the cheeks, which are scarred, as if by a rake, with scarlet furrows and scarlet on the buttocks. And it will be admitted that nature has invested this massive, powerful, and ferocious baboon with a repulsiveness equaling in completeness the extremes of grace and beauty manifested in the roe deer or the bird of paradise. The natives of Guinea and other parts of West Africa have consistent accounts that the mandrills have tried to carry off females and children. They live in troops like the Chakmas, plunder the fields, and, like all baboons, spend much time on the ground walking on all fours. When doing this, they are quite unlike any other creatures. 
They walk slowly with the head bent downwards, like a person walking on hands and knees looking for a pin. With the right hand, usually, they turn over every stick and stone, looking for insects, scorpions, or snails, and these they seize and eat. The writer has seen baboons picking up sand and straining it through their fingers to see if there were ants in it. He has also seen one hold up sand in the palm of its hand and blow the dust away with its breath, and then look again to see if anything edible were left. Mandrills kept in captivity until adult become very savage. One, in Wombwell's menagerie, killed another monkey and a beagle. Mr. Cross owned one which would sit in an armchair, smoke, and drink porter. But these convivial accomplishments were accompanied by a most ferocious temper. One of the earliest accounts of the habits of the Abyssinian baboons was given by Ludolf in his History of Ethiopia. It was translated into quaint but excellent Old English. Of apes, he says, there are infinite flocks up and down in the mountains, a thousand and more together, and they leave no stone unturned. If they meet one that two or three cannot lift, they call for more aid, and all for the sake of the worms that lie under, a sort of diet which they relish exceedingly. They are very greedy after emmets, so that having found an emmet hill, they presently surround it, and laying their forepaws with the hollow downward upon the ant heap, as soon as the emmets creep into their treacherous palms, they lick them off with great comfort to their stomachs, and there they will lie till there is not an emmet left. They are also pernicious to fruits and apples, and will destroy whole fields and gardens unless they be looked after. For they are very cunning, and will never venture in till the return of their spies, which they send always before, who, giving all information that it is safe, in they rush with their whole body and make a quick dispatch. Therefore, they go very quiet and silent to their prey, and if their young ones chance to make a noise, they chastise them with their fists. But if the coast is clear, then everyone has a different noise to express his joy. Ludolf clearly means the baboons by this description. A more ancient story deals with Alexander's campaigns. He encamped on a mountain on which were numerous bands of monkeys, probably baboons. On the following morning, the sentries saw what looked like troops coming to offer them battle. As they had just won a victory, they were at a loss to guess who these new foes might be. The alarm was given, and the Macedonian troops set out in battle array. Then through the morning mist, they saw that the enemy was an immense troop of monkeys. Their prisoners, who knew what the alarm was caused by, made no small sport of the Macedonians. End of section four. Recording by Fraser Prescott. Grand Rapids, Michigan.